So for our Bible time, we are to think about who Jesus is. <clears throat> and um, one might almost say, well, everybody knows the answer to this question. Uh, and indeed, there are lots of different answers uh, that could be given to this question. Uh, <coughs> indeed, in the room here and at home, uh, we might all uh, come up with different answers to one another. Uh, and we're not going to give uh, or work through a list of answers to the questions, uh, to that question. We're just going to take one answer. So you may have said, well, to me, Jesus is the saviour of the world. Or, or you may have said, to me, Jesus is the man who uh, knew temptation, uh, knew how I struggle with life uh, and cope with all that. But uh, there are lots of different uh, angles on uh, the truths about Jesus, but in particular, we're to settle on uh, this evening, this afternoon, uh, the, the appointment that God made uh, for Jesus. And the appointment that God made for Jesus was that he would make him a king. So that in particular is what we want to think about. And um, one of the ways in which we identify that when we look at the scriptures is that Jesus was given a name, and the name of Jesus suggests that he is a king. So we're going to, uh, with that uh, icon there, we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about kings uh, and the name of king. And then we're going to move on and, and we're going to spend some time thinking about why uh, did God have a scheme in his mind, a plan, uh, to make Jesus a king when he could have, for example, uh, have made Jesus a prophet or he could have made Jesus a president or he could have made Jesus um, a, a power of, of, of any uh, of a number of selections. Uh, and in this world of ours, of course, uh, there are not many countries that have kings anymore. But God has decided that Jesus will become a king. So we want to think about that uh, piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Thirdly, using this icon, we're going to come back and use these icons as we go through, so you know where we are. Uh, we're going to do four things. Thirdly, uh, we're going to use the thinking icon here and spend some time thinking about, well, if that's right, uh, that the name of Jesus says he's got to be a king, and if that's right, that it's vital to God's purposes that Jesus should be, uh, that should be a king rather than a president or whoever, then we're going to think about what people thought about Jesus? Did people recognize Jesus? When we read the Gospels, was it obvious there that uh, Jesus would be king? Was that recognized? Well, the fourth thing we want to look at with this uh, slogan is, um, if God has an appointment for Jesus, does God have an appointment for anybody else? Does God have an appointment for us? So we're going to think about uh, what uh, Jesus has to do with us. Let's begin with uh, that first icon that we said, which is to think about the name that God has selected uh, for Jesus and how that name marks him out as being a king. So <clears throat> Jesus is called the Messiah or the Christ or the anointed king. So there's a word there, uh, depending on which language we are using, uh, and they all mean something like a man with an appointment. In English, then? It is the anointed, and kings sometimes become kings by their coronation. Sometimes they become kings by their anointing. In the Bible, it was uh, you would be anointed to be a king. In the Greek language, then, uh, the word for a man who is anointed as a king uh, is the word Christ. And so Jesus' name is Jesus Christ. In the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, and we've just read together a section of that translated into English in our Bibles. We have this word Messiah, uh, and it's the very last word um, of verse 10. So when we read the phrase there at the end of verse 10, and exalt the horn of his anointed, it is in the Hebrew language, it's anoint the, uh, the, the horn of his Messiah. And Messiah is a word that uh, has come from the Hebrew language into our own language. Again, it means exactly the same as Christ. It means uh, one who is anointed. So the point to take away from this is, yes, definitely, our title is right. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God's anointed king. So 
The word is anointed. In fact, sometimes we use uh, the letters, don't we? LJC. And if we see the abbreviation LJC, we, we often recognize, many of us recognize that stands for the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are three components of Jesus's name. So we've talked about Christ. We've referred to him as Jesus. And, and uh, we know that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are the three parts of names that we often find. For example, uh, Stephen Hawking, his given name is Stephen, isn't it? But his family name is Hawking and his professional title is Professor. So Professor Stephen Hawking, the Lord Jesus Christ, the three elements of the name, the honorific, the given and the family name. Sometimes we can have a postnomen as well. Some of you will have letters after your name. Uh, lady I used to work for had DBE after her name. And uh, when I grew up in Wales, people had uh, their employment after their name, like Jones the Shop. Uh, so sometimes uh, it works out in that sort of way. But usually at least there are three parts. Or often there are three parts to a name. But for our study this evening, this afternoon, uh, the important thing is uh, Christ. That's what we're going to be looking at, in particular, the family name of Jesus. The importance, of course, of the family element of our names is that there's an identification with our parents by that. And in particular, in, uh, in, in English, it's an identity, and, and in other nations, it's an identification with the father. So if somebody is given the name of Christ, it means that he will be a king to succeed his father, who was king. We know how that works. So we have in the Bible uh, that Jesus is the king appointed by God by virtue of the fact that he is the son of the king who is God. So Christ implies that Jesus is God's son, in the way that uh, is embodied in, particularly Scandinavian names do this, people like Peter, when they have a son, call their son Peter's son. And that becomes a family name, doesn't it? Or Sorensen or Christianson. You may have come across people with names like that. But in the Bible, it is a pains to explain that Jesus is God's son. And so we've referred there to Hebrews. Now, I don't need you to turn in your Bible to Hebrews because I'm able to press a button and get Hebrews to appear on the screen for you. It took a long time, didn't it? Um, there are three or four places that I would like you to look at in your Bible. This isn't one of them, just for saving of time. We'll just throw the verse up for you and you'll say, oh, yes, I remember that verse. Thou art my son and, and I will be to him a father. And this is the relationship that the Bible is at pains to underline for us. In fact, Jesus was God's first begotten son. And as we said, Jesus is uh, the son who will be the king. Uh, he is the son of the king. And in fact, Jesus was recognized as the son of Joseph, the carpenter. So people would have thought of Jesus as the carpenter's son. But as time went on, they would have another identification <laughs> that they would recognize. And so the carpenter's son would become to be recognized as the Christ, the son of God. Um, there's a couple of verses in the Gospels where they're referring to Jesus, either as the carpenter uh, or the carpenter's son. But in fact, uh, he became the king and they came to recognize that. And we will come back to, uh, in, in our thinking icon uh, section, our third section, we'll come back and have a look uh, some more about how they recognized Jesus. But we'll pass on from that swiftly to the second of the series of ideas that we want to connect up now, which is, well, why a king then? Why is it important in God's plan and purpose that Jesus should be a king? And why it's important is that Jesus should be the ultimate figure that God has uh, for this world. Let me just underline that uh, and ask you, if you would, at this point, to open your Bibles. And we're going to go to the very end of the Bible. And we're going to go to the book of Revelation and the end of the book of Revelation. And let's put that on the screen for you. We're going to uh, look at uh, the end of time in uh, Revelation chapters 15, 17 and 19. You might not have been expecting me to go here. And, and in a sense, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because often in a, in a study like the one that we're doing this afternoon, 
we would choose to uh, go to these ideas, which we're just um, popping out of the book of Revelation, uh, right at the end of the study, rather than as the second of four parts of the study. But there's a reason why I've shifted this into this position, where we're looking at the end of time, and we're going forward in we're time traveling, and we're going to the, to the time now where Jesus has become king. And uh, we want to see uh, what God's purpose was by seeing, first of all now, where God's purpose ends up. So in the end of God's plan and in the future to Bible time, uh, the book of Revelation is, is using a series of pictures to allow us to see into the future and to see when things come to their ultimate of conclusions. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be a king. So this is why we're looking here. And uh, in chapter 15, if you've opened onto that page, please, um, we are reading a section of scripture which describes the end of all evil. And it, it symbolizes that, uh, it represents that, that uh, evil uh, of every description summed up and brought together in the figure of a, a, a horrific beast, a beastly animal. And here is a picture where, where the beast is slain uh, and the slayer of the beast is the great king. Uh, for example, in verse two there, I've just uh, pointed you at verse two on the screen. The text isn't there, but hopefully you can see it in your own Bibles. And then in Revelation 15 and verse two, we can see a battle taking place. There's a, a warfare, there's, there's armies involved. And, and the armies here now are not fighting or shooting or using their weapons. They are singing. And that's an incongruous uh, picture, isn't it? Uh, uh, the book of Revelation is full of strange pictures. But you see why the, the armies are singing in verse 2. They're singing because the warfare, the war is over. The beast has been defeated. The king has become the victor. And this is God's great plan, that God should overcome all evil. And so the singers here now in verse 3 are singing a song. It says, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, which is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. We said he was the Lord Jesus Christ, the saviour of the world, the great king. But he's also the Lamb who sacrifices himself. But that's along the way to becoming the ultimate king. So they're singing this song because all of that uh, that God had planned has at last happened. And they're singing to God. God is the king, verse 4, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, and all nations shall come and worship before thee. So God's plan has run its course through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to ask the question, how did that happen? And why did that happen? And the how is a, is a huge question, because the way that it happens is not the way anybody else could have predicted it would happen. Normally, uh, armies are defeated by larger armies, or armies are overcome by armies that have got uh, more weaponry, or more financial backing behind them, or more strategy. Armies, are, uh, sorry, battles are often not won uh, by people who are good people, but by people who are better generals, maybe even more evil people. And we live in a world that has a, a history of uh, nations being suppressed, beaten back by exploitative rulers. But in this battle, the secret weapon here, the force that prevails when King Jesus wields his power, is the power of holiness. Again, that's a shocking idea, isn't it? Because it's not what normally happens. It's outside our experience. So there is a war here, and all opponents of King Jesus are overcome by the power of holiness. That's quite remarkable. But that's the situation here. And that's why we say we are dealing with ultimate things here in God's plan and purpose, God's ultimate project is to elevate Jesus as a king above all other kings. I mean, uh, over the page into chapter 17, uh, we see the idea that not only is Jesus better than all of the other armies and a better king and a better general, but we see that Jesus is longer lived than the other kings. In fact, Jesus in this chapter becomes the eternal king. 
So Jesus uh, inherits a situation where uh, a war has played out in which uh, many of, the, uh, of those who come to oppose Jesus actually have ended up opposing themselves in verses uh, 15 and 16. They've ended up fighting against themselves. And so they've helped Jesus uh, to defeat them. Certainly in verse 14, there is a war scene, a great ultimate battle playing out. But once again, and now this, this still in Revelation and chapter 19, this scenario is playing out for us in this prophetic apocalyptic vision. Uh, and again, the ingredient, the secret ingredient that makes all of the difference down there at verse 11 of chapter 19 now is the power of righteousness. Just as when Jesus uh, was amongst men and told parables and shot them um, and confounded them by the simplicity of some of the ideas that he used and the rightness of his case. So in the end of time, when he becomes a great king, he will win, as he always does, through a surprising turn of events. And the surprising thing that unfolds here, well, it's righteousness, isn't it? I saw heaven open, verse 11 says, and a white horse, and he that sat on him was faithful and true, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And who would have thought that being more righteous than everybody else would make the difference between success and failure? But this is the picture here that's presented to us. So in lots of ways, the unexpected is playing out. God has planned to bring an unexpected turn to the history of mankind, the history of the planet, and it involves and requires that Jesus should be the king in this situation. So in verse 12 here, the next verse, we see Jesus is crowned, not just crowned as kings are normally crowned, but crowned with more than one crown. And that's a bizarre thing if you try and picture it and visualise it in, its art, in your eyes, but it's, it's spiritual language. It's representing that Jesus is crowned and crowned more emphatically, more de definitely, more completely, more ultimately, in fact, just ultimately without the more, isn't it? Uh, but he's multiply crowned. He doesn't only have the name of a king, but he has a spiritual name, which no man can know. And as well as the name of a king, he's got other names. Verse 13 tells us that he's known as the word of God, which uh, comes in the gospels, but it's here it's repeated. Not only does he have then a crown of a king, and a name, which is the, the name of an ultimate king, but he has a logo, he has a sash about him, which also represents his unique qualities. And the logo says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is the end. This is absolutely ultimate time and ultimate space, the ultimate picture, the fulfillment of it all. And it is King Jesus. So yeah. We struggled a little bit to, to get into words some of these ideas, but we, we tried to say that God requires that Jesus can only ever be the great king. He has to be the king. That's the plan. Let's just rest that idea a little bit. We won't pick it up again, but let's move on then to what we said we do thirdly, which is think. And think about what people thought. You know, often we're in our world, our, our thinking is conditioned by the media, isn't it? The television or the internet or whatever it is. Uh, what do people think? What are people saying about things? And of course, it was true when Jesus came. And when we read the four Gospels, we have this picture that people were discussing all of the time. Who is this Jesus? What do we make of him? Is he a good man? Is he a bad man? Is he a prophet? Is he a priest? Is he... It was hard for them to answer the question... Is he the king? Because for hundreds of years, they would not had a king in Jerusalem, which was where the discussion all centred. But here was Jesus, and uh, they understood, if they understood anything, they understood that Jesus was to have God's name. They understood, and uh, you might like to do this, or, or you might like to just take my word for it. But if we go back to the Gospel of Matthew, which is what you might like to do in the end of Go the Gospel of Matthew, I've got the reference on the screen there. It's uh, Matthew 26 and verse 63. But there are a series of references which we'll just touch on quickly about what people thought. And one of the things that they thought was that Jesus was the Son of God. That was a claim that was made, it was stated. Other people denied and rejected it. You know, the way people vary about uh, what they think 
Uh, they've all got different opinions. They're all happy to contradict everybody else's opinions. But people were certainly stating, uh, and you can see, that it was an outrageous statement to make in, in the thinking of a lot of people. And yet it had to be stated because it was absolutely obvious to many people that Jesus was the Son of God, that everybody was waiting for uh, the Son of the King, that the Bible was full of messages about the Christ who would be born, uh, and this seemed to be the man, uh, as far as many people were concerned. But Jesus himself, just a couple of pages back in chapter 24, Jesus himself said in two verses in that chapter there on the screen, he said, of course, there are many people who are going to rise up and are going to say, I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. Jesus says, that, I know that's going to happen. There are going to be false claimants to the Messiah role. But Jesus didn't shun from declaring that he was the Messiah of Scripture. In fact, Jesus, in the chapter before that, again, chapter 23, Jesus says, and there is only one. Well, of course, there can be, can't there? We've been to Revelation. We've seen that there, there's only room in this world for one ultimate king. And Jesus says, one is your master, even Christ, even the king appointed by God. That, that's absolutely true. So, so those statements that people were debating, Jesus was being clear about for them. Well, that was one of the things that they understood. Another thing that they understood, secondly, in yellow there then, is that Jesus was the son of David. And if we ask the question, in case we're not sure, who was David? Well, the answer is David was the king. David was one of the great kings in Israel's history. He said uh, they hadn't had a king for a long time. Jesus would be the king who would be a lineal descendant from King David of old. And there are uh, verses here uh, from uh, the verse in the 22nd chapter to the very first verse of the New Testament, uh, to uh, the verses in chapter 2, where the wise men are coming from the east when Jesus is born and saying, where's the man who's going to be born king of the Jews then? They knew that he would be the son of David. They also, thirdly, they understood that there was, there was a time when the, the son of God was going to be born. And in fact, there are several verses on the screen there that talk about a man who was told that he uh, would not, and he was an old man by the time this happened, a man who was told that he would not die until the king of God's appointment came. And then there was, in chapter 3 of Luke, now where, where we are on the screen, uh, there was that, that general mood that everybody was abuzz with, with the feeling that this was the time. The time was right. And, and uh, if you know your prophecies of Daniel, you understand uh, how they come to that conclusion. We won't digress down there. Just notice that expression that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 4, the fullness of time. They were aware that God's program was ticking and moving forward and that they were living in the time of the king, Jesus. Well, those are the three things that we've said people recognize so far. We'll just add three more to them. They also knew that he was the chosen one of God, which is a one of those by the way phrases, but actually in Bible language, it's a very particular phrase. The chosen of God meant this particular king. And they use it in that sense. The coming one. Mary and Martha thought of Jesus as the coming one. Same sort of idea. The Bible promised that someone would come to be king. And they had a shorthand. They just referred to it as the coming one. We read it recently in our daily readings. Um, he that shall come will come. They all knew that there was one who would come. And many were recognizing that that was Jesus. The Messiah, the name we've already picked up from, we'll come back to in our fourth part. One with authority in his mouth. What, what does that mean? They said, he speaks with authority and not as the scribes. And it's hard for us to quite tune into exactly what they were saying. But can you imagine uh, that that was something quite unique. There was something quite unique about Jesus' speech. And it was king's speech. I think that's what it means. I can't prove that to you. There are several places where, where we can remark upon it. We're not going to do that. But the way Jesus spoke, and there were many more things that marked Jesus out as a man they knew was something special, and some of them had gone the journey right up to the first point, which was that Jesus was God's appointed king. Now, on the other hand, 
There were things that they didn't understand, and we might be surprised about the things that they didn't understand. I'm only going to give you two here. Uh, it took them a long time to understand that before Jesus could be king, Jesus had got to be what the verse in Revelation used uh, the word lamb for, that Jesus had got to suffer, and not only suffer, but suffer severely and suffer so much so that he had to suffer upon the cross. In other words, be crucified. Now, we can grasp that idea well because we're used to it as a historical fact. But in fact, when Jesus was, was alive in the time of the Gospels, people couldn't grasp this idea at all. There were very, very few people who could relate to the fact that the Bible required that the king appointed by God must die for the people and for the world. It's a truth uh, that's core to Christianity, but it was not much understood. In fact, when you look for evidence of it in the Gospels, it's quite hard to find verses for it. Uh, I think, and I might be mistaken here, but the only one I could find, or the only two that I could find, are those two in Luke chapter 24 there on the screen for you. Lots more in the other parts of the, of the New Testament and lots in the Old Testament but not much in the Gospels. They didn't understand that at first then. And the other big thing, which is surprising for us all, I think, is that they didn't understand that, that the king appointed by God would have to rise, be resurrected, rise from the dead. Now, they knew about resurrection in the way that most people in the world today know about resurrection. Most people don't believe in resurrection. That's what they know about resurrection. People couldn't grasp that Jesus must rise from the dead. And yet it's a basic New Testament teaching. Interesting. Well, let's move quickly on again to the fourth area that we want to discover, which is, well, where do we fit into this? So let's talk about keeping appointments, which we use calendars for. Maybe we use Google, maybe we use Outlook. Maybe use uh, the old fashioned ones where you write in with a biro. But we have appointments and we keep appointments. And Jesus had the great appointment that the Bible is centered on. And Jesus kept the appointment. And we ask questions about ourselves then when we reflect on Jesus's appointment and our own appointment, shall we? We've looked at this word Messiah, uh, strong as it's got a number. Uh, We've suggested that it means anointed, and we could look it up in Strong's and see that. Uh, priests are anointed as well as kings, so let's, uh, let's be aware that the word doesn't necessarily apply a man who's going to be a priest. Uh, three times in Leviticus chapter 4, for example, uh, it's the priests who are anointed. The fifth occurrence in the Bible is the one that we read together in our introductory reading from Hannah's song. She said that God would give strength to his king, and to his anointed. Her song is specifically about the Lord Jesus Christ. A surprising thing when you think of the time in history when she lived, but there it is. It relates to the Lord Jesus Christ as well as other subjects, and she is the first woman in the Bible to use the word Messiah, God's appointed king. <laughs> other examples, uh, later on in Samuel, you can come to the 12th chapter where Saul is anointed as a king and then in chapter 16 where David is anointed as the second of Israel's kings we can even come in Isaiah's prophecy uh, and find that a, a man is anointed as a king not of Israel at all but of the Medo-Persian empire uh, the king of Persia of all things is in the bible because he too relates to our king king Jesus the king appointed by God. By the way, we're not going to follow that idea up, but we're just being aware that an anointed one by God might be a priest, he might be a king, but he might be the king. So see how I've written that with capital letters, perhaps as you would expect, because of all the kings that we come across, and we've mentioned Saul, and we've mentioned David, and we've mentioned Cyrus of a foreign nation, Yet of all of them, only one of them deserves that title, the king, which doesn't require you even to say the king Jesus. 
or the King Christ or the King who is called the Lord Jesus Christ or the King who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because simply to say the King is enough. In the Bible, although there are many kings, it is true to say there is only one king. There is only one important king in the Bible, just as in the world of rock and roll. Uh, if we talk about the king, then everybody knows we're talking about Elvis Presley. Or if we say EP, uh, people say, oh, Elvis Presley. In the Bible, if we say LJC, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the king of kings, talking about the Lord of lords, because Jesus is the Bible's king. So that was his appointment. What is our appointment? Our appointment is connected with his appointment, isn't it? Because a king can't be a king on his own. A king has to be a king of a nation. A king has to be the king of a land. A king has to be the king of people. Those who belong to the king are the king's subjects. And the Bible has a name for the king's subjects. Here it is. I can't see it on my screen because of Zoom. But it's disciples. So the word disciples means people who have an appointment to become the king's subjects. So that's a special Bible word, isn't it? Uh, a name that has a particular resonance, just in the way uh, we've been exploring the way Christ has a particular resonance. It means much more for a man to be born to be Christ than for a man to be born to be a carpenter, because the world may be full of carpenters, but the world will only ever have one Christ. One, the king. Maybe in something of the same way. We, if we think of ourselves as followers of Jesus and of disciples of Jesus, those who take on the name of Jesus and recognize ourselves and describe ourselves by the Bible word disciples, maybe that sets us into a very singular category. But in fact, the Bible doesn't want to give us the name disciples. He doesn't want us to be disciples. He wants us to be more than disciples because we are more than subjects of a king. Because we are subjects of the king, we must have a special name for ourselves. And Jesus changes the name of disciples or servants of his, subjects of his kingdom, into the name of friends of Jesus and sons of Jesus. So this is the last uh, area of scripture that I'd like you to see on your own pages, if you wouldn't mind. And this is in John's Gospel, and we're going to uh, browse through uh, a few verses out of John 13, 14, and 15, where some important ideas uh, exist. Jesus is making these ideas important in the context of this subject, where we are what we are because of who he is. Not only are we Jesus' friends by him, but we are Jesus' friends because of him. So let's pick this uh, appointment that Jesus has made for us up out of chapter 13, which uh, many of you here will recognize is the chapter uh, which uh, has the first um, couple of paragraphs uh, all uh, tell the story of when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. In other words, it's to do with servants. Jesus, the great king, first of all, makes himself the great servant of all and washes their feet. Why does he do that? It's like a parable, isn't it? You have to go uh, and ask the question, what's going on here? And he's drawing a lesson out. And the lesson is, like me are you. You will be like me. You must be like me. And it's there, chapter 13, and verse 13 says, you call me master and Lord. Well, they were right. They could have called him Christ and King, and they would have been right. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, our master. That's all right. But the lesson in the next two verses is you've got to be related to this. If that's my appointment, you've got an appointment too. You've got to make that move. You've got to do what I do. As I have loved you, verse 34, you've got to love you as a community. You've got to love one another. There's, there's that great big lesson that comes through on that first part of the chapter. And then there's the second part of John chapter 13, which, again, you'll know well enough without me, uh, well, with me only needing to just suggest it to you. It, it's the story that deals with the unveiling of the betrayer, Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Jesus. 
And, and then again, there's a lesson. Why does that happen? Well, there's a lesson that comes out of that. And of course, the obvious lesson is, what a terrible thing, what a tragedy, what a dire event that Jesus should be betrayed. But Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the lesson. The lesson of what's happening here is the lesson of glorification. And it's verse 31 there uh, where Jesus uses that word. And of course, that must be the lesson, mustn't it? God's appointed king cannot be a figure of tragedy. God's appointed king can only ever be a figure of glory. But the appointment of Jesus is related to the appointment of us. And if Jesus is appointed to glory, then his disciples are appointed to glory too. And that idea is picked up. But first, Jesus shows these things in verse 32 are imminent. Jesus will be glorified at that point in history. And we're in the year AD 30, we think, at this point in time. Jesus will uh, very shortly, in verse 33, ascend to keep the appointment in heaven with his father. This is where the, the key step is, where Jesus is moving into his new role as the king, the one who will bring in the kingdom of God. And those things, therefore, uh, as the chapter moves into chapter 14 uh, and speaks about what this means to us and our appointment, these ideas are joined up again. Jesus's appointment to be with the Father is effective for the disciples also. And just cast your eye down in chapter 14 and have a look at verse 23 there. Because the way this is effective in the Lord Jesus's case is that he, two things, keeps God's word and loves God. And he says, those are the keys for you and for your appointment. I want you, I need you to keep God's word and to love God, to be like me, to do like I have done. So there is, top of the side there, there is an appointment for us that the story of Jesus tells. And that's where I've got to stop. Jesus, who is he? He is many things. In our study today, he is the king appointed by God. There's a confusion of words here, isn't there? He's anointed, which Christ means, so that he can be appointed, which is God's plan, to be the king. But what we've added to that, isn't it, is those two words at the end, which weren't in our announced title. Jesus is the king appointed by God for us. And that's what it's all about. That's what these chapters in John are arguing, that we must have that transition in our lives from being ordinary people those who've chosen to follow God, those who are disciples, to those who are involved and take on the name of God and the name of sons. We are no more servants, but we are sons of God through him. And so John, who has recorded this gospel for us and these events in this series of chapters, tells us in the epistle that he writes, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, and now we're in the time that we've already glanced at in Revelation, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And so the very name that God has given Jesus is a name that is full of, of promise and importance for each one of us.